Hello. Good morning for everyone who is listening in from Europe, and good afternoon for those who is based in China. Welcome to the EU SME Center webinar series.、Um, This is Erica Ning working at the training center of the EU SME Center. Today's topic is exporting dairy products to China, new food safety law, and cross-border e-commerce policy. Just a quick refresh of the EU SME Center. We are a project set up by the European Commissions in Beijing. We help the European SMEs doing business in China through、um, by providing useful information via our knowledge center, answering business questions via our advice center, and provide hands-on trainings via our training center. And the center is implemented by a consortium of six partners, as you see in the screen here. And for more information about the EU SME Center, please visit our website. I I know not of you are very familiar with the、uh, webinar platform, but for the newcomers today, I just want to give you a quick reminder that、um, you could use the control panel on the left of your screen. To submit questions and comments, and our expert today will answer your questions by the end of in the end of the webinar. And in case your question is not addressed during the webinar, please post the questions through while while ask the experts on our website. And I have our IT officer sitting next to me, and who will be supporting for if you have any technical issues. Okay, and I would like to introduce our expert today, Pablo. Pablo is the director of Abens and who has many years experience supporting and advising European small and medium-sized enterprises in doing business in China, particularly in food and beverage sectors, and which, of course, including a lot of dairy products. Just before I hand over to Pablo,、um, I would like to launch the first two posts of today to get a better understanding of your background and your expectation on today's webinar. I will give you just a couple of seconds to finish the poll, and then we will review the answers. Okay, let's see. So more over half of you are consulting companies or. Private service providers, and about 24% are public agent, and there's also a small number of producers and distributors of dairy products. And our second question is, as you see in the screen, that we Pablo will be covering. Quite a number of、um, quite quite a number of points, useful points in exporting dairy to China, and、um, we would like to know which session are you interested in most. Just a few more seconds to get an answer, and then we will close it and share with you the result.
Okay. So let's review the result of our poll questions. Um, I will hand it over to Pablo, who will be covering all those points during the next 20, 45 minutes. Okay, so um, welcome to everyone and thank you very much for your time and um, for making yourselves available for this uh, webinar of the USME Center. We have a full house today. We have around 160 attendees registered for this webinar. Um, as we can see, you have interest in basically all the issues that we will be covering today. Um, we will be focusing on many things, but certainly we will discuss today a lot on the new regulation, okay? Now, there is other USME Center webinars and uh, materials from the Knowledge Center that you can use or will be able to use shortly. So we will also be referring you to them if you want further information. Um, we will be spending about an hour all together and we hope we can cover all the contents. Now, uh, keep in mind that presentation today is a little dense. There is a lot of information. It's not very complex to understand, but there is a lot of information. We hope to be covering the main ideas, but if you have further questions, please send them to the USME Center um, or send it today and we will do the best we can to answer them, okay? So um, for the context today, we've divided into six sections. We'll see the daily exports to China. How are we doing in exporting daily to China? Then we will go directly to see what's the new regulatory developments that China is having at the moment. Um, and then we go through, let's say, generic or more basic stuff that you need to know anyway regarding process map uh, from the origin to China, from Europe to China, and steps to export to China. So our SMEs can actually go step by step uh, through the whole process. It is very important that we also see the key points once the product is in China, so we actually are able to manage our way into China. And finally, as promised, we will check how e-commerce um, works for daily products. So let's go to the first section, daily exports to China. Um, basically, we're covering today the following products. Most of you are aware of the situation, but um, the daily products and the daily regulation in China will cover um, the following HS codes, uh, 0401, that will be for, let's say, standard, standard UHT milk and cream. Um, also, 0402, that's milk and cream concentrated or containing other sugar. That is where the milk powder is included. That represents more than half of the total China imports in value in 2014, okay? We will also cover in yogurt, which is relatively small, whey and modified whey, about 10% of the market, of the import uh, market share, butter and other fat, far, fats, of course, um, cheese and curd, and finally, very important, uh, pre infant formula, preparations for infant use. This is very, very important. This is probably one of the products that have changed more um, regarding new regulation and actually it's already the most complicated one on daily products, so it's very important to understand what's the situation. Now, if you are also selling ice cream, um, we will not devote much time into it, but briefly, if you're selling basically iced, which is water with flavor and powder, then it's okay. This doesn't apply to you. If you're selling milk-based ice cream, then you will also have to check on uh, possible regulations. It's a little bit of a different product. If you're in this case, please send the USME Center an email and we will address it individually so we can focus on the main products at the moment. Now, as you can see in the slide, daily export to China look very, very good. Um, since the scandals of the melanin milk in 2008, basically imports have pushed, 
uh, it is a very, very promising pr uh, product and very, very promising market, not only for big companies, but also a lot of small and medium enterprises have managed to get into the market. Um, this is, for any foreseeable time, expected to be lasting, but now we have to be more careful than ever on the new regulations applying. So we will have to be very, let's say, vigilant and keep updated a lot if we want to do things right and access the market, okay? Um, today we will not put much of attention on the commercial issues. We'll put most on the regulatory issues, but you will have the chance uh, to read more on different guidelines later on. We will be uh, directing you to them. Now, if we see China imports, where do they come from? Um, we still see that New Zealand is certainly the market leader, more than half of the market, but coming down from the previous 66% a few years ago. Um, then we have USA, Australia, and the European Union represents 27% of the imports. Among those uh, leading countries are the Netherlands, France, Ireland, Germany, and Denmark. But basically, any product, any country with a protocol and able to export to China is growing and is doing well, okay? So it, it is actually a promising market for all the SMEs in countries that do have a protocol. The key issues that we have to take into consideration when we're exporting um, can be identified in the following group. So we have, on one side, as an SME, we have to understand that we cannot export from any country at any moment dairy products to China. There is the need for our countries, let's say any country where you're from in Europe and China, to sign a bilateral agreement that is called a protocol. And that protocol will also create the need or include the need for a specific document, a health certificate or export model, so you're able to export from your country to China. Now we will um, later on show you a list of the countries that do have this protocol um, actually signed and into effect and those that are still working on it, okay? If you have any questions after that, please send us an email and uh, we will reply. You also need to register at AQSAQ. AQSAQ, for those that do not know, is um, the Supervision and Quarantine Administration in China. Basically, they take control of the things, in our case, the food stuff, coming into China. So whatever we need to do to get into China, they will control once in China. There is other institutions that will um, take it from there and place control on what is happening on the food market. It is very important, and we will focus today a lot on the regulation, which is unstable and probably excessive. Uh, they could be much more concentrated in order, and it changes a lot. Now, the last time we did, the first time we did this webinar was in springtime 2014, because regulation was changing, was about to change the 1st of May 2014. 15 months later, we are doing again this webinar because regulation has changed so much and probably will continue to do so and certainly will continue to do so in the next months. There is an unclear implementation of the new regulations for a number of issues. Uh, some regulations have been implemented, but then the development of the regulation is still under draft. Uh, they may be some bias part of the regulation. They may enter into conflict with other regulations and still don't know what will happen exactly with them. And besides the regulation issues, there is the matter of the implementation. It is common in China that when we have a new regulation, especially if it is complex, not all the entry points behave in the same way. So it may be a change from one entry point to another until the situation is clear and the smokes clean up. So what can we do? Well, we are going to study what to do. We're going to follow um, a very thoughtful way to see what is changing, what is clear, and what is not, and we're going to keep updated at all times. Um, continuously, we also have to keep into consideration that 
this lack of consist consistency in the capstone clearance procedure does not only apply to this case. We in, in China, for many products, we normally tend to have this problem. We will see later when we speak about the first import concept. And this will bring delays of custom clearance. So do not expect that it's the first time you're sending a product into China, especially dairy products. They're gonna, you're gonna clear customs in two weeks because that's very, very, very rare, okay? So plan ahead. Let's check if I'm mentioning a lot of new regulatory developments. Let's check what I'm talking about. Well, if you want a starting point, you do have from the USME Center an already published dairy exports to China guideline. This will explain how the situation was in April 2014. Many of the contents and a lot of ideas are still valid, but uh, the USME Center, in cooperation with us, are working on an update that will be available in a few weeks. We will see that at the end. So there is already information available, and you will have updated information published in a few weeks, okay? So what are the new regulatory developments that we are facing? Well, if you want to see it like this, it all comes from the new safety law, which uh, entered into implementation the 1st of October 2015, after a very short um, period to get comments from anybody else, any other countries that would like to comment on it. And from the new food safety law, then we have a lot of additional regulatory developments. Some of them are already implemented, the ones you see the date, 1st of October 2015. That goes for the sampling and inspection, that goes for the food operating license or the food production. However, others, the ones that you see on the side draft, um, are actually not being implemented. So the Chinese are sent a draft of the way they would like to do this regulation, and now they're getting comments from, for example, other countries or other organizations on how this should come into effect. Now, this means that at the moment, there is a little bit of confusion on what is being drafted, and it doesn't really mean that, that will be implemented uh, immediately. Also, if it is implemented immediately from the regulatory point of view, we will have to see how the reality operates on any entry point. Generally speaking, um, I think it's fair to say that the new food safety law reinforces very clearly all the conditions for food safety um, on, on any product, and especially into dairy and some specific products that infant formula, um, by basically making two main changes in the nature of how this is gonna be controlled. On one side, it involves or requires from everybody involved a much higher level of control. We're gonna see a lot of examples, but now it's not AQSAQ checking at the border or checking previously. Now it's expected from every actor in the market to actually check what is receiving, what is doing, and what is supplying to the next one. And this is a very important change. And second, um, it, it, it introduces explicitly a lot of things that you can and you cannot do, um, eliminating a lot of unclear situations that were in the market previously, okay? Those are the two main changes in the approach. Um, the new food safety law is actually much stance than the previous one, um, from about 100 to 150 articles, and introduces a lot of changes that we will have to keep update, uh, since some of them are final, others are not. Um, but one main idea that I want to underline is um, it also allows or gives room to local governments to introduce some developments or some specific conditions additional to the general conditions. So some cities, municipalities, or provinces may go over what is based as a minimum standard on the food safety law. If we shall get into some specifics, um, 
the importers need to examine the exporters and producers. Producers, that means that you will not take for granted that if they feel the paperwork, it works, we will have to consider that um, it actually has to be checked from the producer point of view, okay? Also, the, right now, it, it's already supposed to be happening, but now it will be much more clear the way it's going to work. The Chinese Food and Drug Administration will supervise all the food imported once inside. It's supposed to be happening already, but the new idea is that now it will be done much more continuously and effectively, and they will communicate with AQSIQ, let's say, to stop or communicate with any company outside China if they're not doing what they're supposed to. Um, new penalties or a stronger or more clear way of actually punishing the companies that are not following the regulation by eliminating you from the AQSIQ list, which in fact will make for you impossible to keep exporting. And there is also a more detailed way on labels and instructions that you need to follow. We will see some more information about this later. More ideas that are being introduced, um, and I know it's a lot of information so far, but you can keep this uh, recording from the USME Center website later, so you can hear it more than once. Um, another key idea is that you need to keep an import and sale record. So the information is not lost once your sale is done or you basically the traceability concept, the being able to track what you, your supplier and your client are doing, it is now necessary, okay? So products can be tracked, quality can be measured in much more um, a stronger way. There will be credit records or track records, tied inspections, and you may be listed as um, a good company or not so good company, okay? So this is also very important. Considering the infant formula, and that is about 20% of the exports or the imports in China in terms of value, um, and probably one of the most promising products that you have in China at the moment, you may have heard that Chinese are buying it from abroad via internet, that they go to Hong Kong, uh, to buy the product because it's um, hard to get some places in China. It's certainly a very promising product. There is a specific changes to make it even more strict, therefore to make it even more safer. Now, we will see later how safer it also means an advantage from our point of view, uh, creating a very clear competitive advantage of imported products. So don't be afraid, but you need to get familiar with it. By being safer, basically we're being able to sell and grow in the Chinese market, not based on price competition, okay? We will see this later. So now you have to hand in a lot of information that you didn't have to in the past, like research and development reports that in the past we didn't have to submit, and now we do have to submit. Now, we have new regulations on making brands for other or making packaging or brand... Uh, packaging for other companies to use as their private label, this is restricted now. And we are now pro um, prohibited to um, sell the same formula under different brands. Now I'll explain why this is very important. Basically in China, from the commercial point of view, it is very common that they will ask for exclusivity. This is common practice uh, in the Chinese commercial wall when you're talking about food in China for a number of reasons. Now, the way that the exporters have responded to this is basically developing many different brands for the same formula. So you will have your brand uh, Milk River and then you will also sell Milk Mountain and Milk Valley and you will keep selling the same brand. Now. With the new regulation, this will not be possible because with the same formula, we can only use one brand, okay? So this is not only meant for controlling foreign companies, this is meant especially for controlling domestic companies doing so. But as a result, it affects all of us. All the producers, both 
foreign and domestic of infant formula need to be registered at the Chinese Food and Drug Administration. Um, as foreigners, our SMEs will do it in cooperation with their um, national governments, okay? We're limited to three brands and three uh, formulas per brand, so that gives us nine formulas maximum, okay? Three brands, three formulas per brand, nine formulas maximum. We cannot produce more than these. Um, we can only use cow or goat milk, and, and this is very important, labels in Chinese must be placed in the product before arriving in China. Now, it was very common at the moment that we will sell, send the products to the Chinese port with the original label from Europe, and then in the warehouse in China, but before we go through customs, they will put a sticker on top with the Chinese information. Now, this for infant formula is not allowed anymore. It has to come from the origin, okay? We will see later how this may also be the case for the rest of products, but that is not confirmed yet. That is uh, on a draft. But for infant formula, it, it, it will be so, okay? Also, very important, extremely important, because we can see in the market that there is a lot of confusion on this issue. Cross-border e-commerce will be subject to the same requirements that any normal traditional import. Now, this was supposed to be the case before, but there was a lot of confusion, and certainly um, the application was very flexible. So products will go sometimes unchecked, um, there will be a lot of things that you could do in practice, even though you may not be able to do it. Now the idea is that this will not happen anymore. The law is not, will now be very clear on this issue, and implementation may take some time to catch up, but it looks like it's the direction that it's taking, okay? So do not mistake and think that if it is cross-border e-commerce, anything goes because that is not going to be the case. This is very important, this is very common. We will get to e-commerce um, towards the end of the presentation to explain more about this. Now, for Chinese producers, um, we will have the possibility of having uh, more brands, theoretically. This may enter into conflict with the previous regulations, so we will see how it turns up, but it will not affect us as a European exporters. Um, a different formula must have six or more different ingredients, otherwise it's not a different formula. And for the same commercial issues that I explain later, um, you cannot restrict their sales based on geographic reasons. Again, this links to the commercial issue and with exclusivity issues. If we continue checking the regulation, um, there is still the draft, so we will see how it finally shapes, but uh, we have to see the operation of food selling online, okay? So third-party e-commerce platforms and operators, let's see what that means. Um, e-commerce in China may be done um, directly, I guess, that if you buy online, then you can say it's e-commerce, but the reality of the market is that the Chinese will go to e-commerce platforms. E-commerce platforms is like a shopping mall. When you go in real life to a shopping mall and there are shops there selling their products, same thing, exactly the same thing, only it operates online. It's shopping shop. You go to, namely, Tmall or JD.com and it's like a huge shopping mall and there you pick your shop. The shop will be operated by the shopping mall directly or maybe operating by the distributor most commonly the second case. Those are the e-commerce platforms and operators, okay? If you want to know more, I will tell you at the end of the webinar where to get more information. So they need to check the information is solid and consistent. Again, now we all have to check. Everybody who is involved in the process has to check that everything works. It's not that I believe what the previous guy told me and so I pass the product and the information to the next guy now every step of the chain you may have to check, you're supposed to check at the very least. 
Um, you also have to obtain, if you're the operator of the food, uh, a certificate from the Chinese Food and Drug Administration, CFDA, and you have to display it in the website. And you need to check, either you're doing it yourself or you are the shopping mall and then the, the shop inside is doing it. But you, as a shop, shopping mall, need to check that the delivery is adequate in terms of quality, okay, in terms of food safety. safety. Let's continue. How about um, food imported via cross-border e-commerce? Now, some people will say, well, what's cross-border e-commerce to start with? Uh, we will see this at the very end, but just consider for a moment that um, there's two big ways in which we could do e-commerce in China. One is the traditional. Um, that is the way you do it in, in your home countries in Europe. Uh, product will be already in China and you're selling it online. This is fine. And there is the possibility of doing it cross-border. Okay? If we do it cross-border, um, the product are not in China. The product are outside China or at least out, outside China customs. This is cross-border e-commerce. Okay? Now, um, when we do cross-border e-commerce, product may be in Europe, and then we have to fly the product, and it still will take days. Or there was a development of free trade zones, like bonded areas in China, but without going through customs, uh, so the product could be delivered much faster in a much more efficient way. Can, uh, can the people hear me or not sure? For how long did we have this problem? Do we know? Are we on air now? Okay. Um, sorry, everyone. It seems that we've had a problem with the connection. So I'll uh, rewind a little bit for a couple seconds and I'll continue. Um, if you want to learn about China, well, this is another important lesson. Um, internet connection between China and outside, sometimes it doesn't work as we would like to and this is very common. Okay, so we were talking about cross-border e-commerce. We said that cross-border is when the product is coming from outside China, otherwise it's traditional e-commerce. And we said that this could come in two ways. It could be based in Europe, and then you send the product, or it could be already in China, but in, the, in a free trade zone, in a bonded warehouse. That means that it's physically in China, but has not been through customs, okay? Now, this second model using free trade zone is becoming very popular, and it has a lot of advantages, but there's also regulation on that, okay? So, as we said before, the infant formula needs to be labeled before it arrives to China, before it gets to this customs area. Um, now, how will they inspect this? It is also a question for myself. They may not have the capability of making inspections of everything, but you are supposed to do it. If they do the inspection and you haven't done it, it is you who are not complying, okay? In the website, you need to show e-labels, that is, the label, but you have to show it on the website. And certainly, not because you are selling online, you cannot avoid having the relevant documents or not being able to keep traceability. You need to keep your traceability system, okay? Now, in the event that the products will come directly from Europe, like the Chinese consumer will go and buy on your website, then these changes may not um, be applying, okay? But if, if it is on the cross-border e-commerce under the bonded internet shopping model, it has to. Thank you, Pablo, for outlining the regulatory changes for us. And we would just like to know what's your plan after um, listening to the outline the changes so 
We are going to launch the third poll of today. As you see in the screen, um, would you keep a constant update till the regulation is fully implemented, or you plan to check just from time to time for the next year to review the status of the new regulations, or you don't see the need to keep a close look at it till next year? We will give the participants a few more seconds. Then we will close the poll and review the answer. And we see that the majority of you have choose to keep a constant update till the regulation is fully implemented. Um, Pablo, would you like to comment on this? Okay. Um, generally speaking, I would say the result is is very good. Um, I would suggest that you do what 76% of the people said. You keep constantly updated. Um, but I also understand that for some people that are exploring the possibility of accessing China, it may they may not have operations outside at the moment, so they want to check from time to time, and certainly always before actually engaging in any business. So some of them may be exploring the option until it's only a theoretical idea, they can check from time to time. But the moment they actually want to take um, commercial and legal actions in China, you have to be constantly updated. Okay, this is very good that nobody said, well, I don't need to keep an eye on it. Uh, this is the way it is and it's not going to change or it's not important because that is not the case, obviously. So very good there with the question. Um, let's make some progress and let's see the process map from the origin to China. Now this is not a change. This is basically a general description. Some of our audience may already be aware of this situation. Some of them are not. So we will go fast uh, so you can see it. If you want more information, you will check the, info the guidelines that we will be supplying later on. Now, the process map for um, dairy especially, um, it, it resembles, all, all the products resemble something similar, but especially for dairy, can be simplified graphically in the, same, in the following way. First, at the country level, you need the protocol, you need the bilateral agreement. And these, as a company, you cannot do. There is nothing or very little that you can do if you're in a country that is still does not have the protocol. Okay? You cannot start exporting by yourself, no matter how proactive you are. But you may cooperate with your government to, see the, to get the, the, the negotiation and the protocol moving. Um, the protocol will supply an export model or sanitary certificate that you need to use, of course. And additionally, then we go to step two. Next, step two, you need to register. Now, register, there is some things you can do. There is a food star exporter registration. You need to register as a daily exporter. Um, you have to be listed. Uh, that is something that you will do half yourself, half in cooperation with your government. Um, institution in charge of negotiation with China you will exchange some information with your government and your government with the Chinese government until you get published. That means you can export. You have to do some things on your own. The government has to do something on its own. And a few things you need to do together, like this one. Assuming that we have all the licenses and we're able to get all the normal paperwork to export, we go through China inspections. We send the product. They check the labeling. They do the quarantine and they change that all the paperwork is right. If this is the case, um, then say, well, you're good to import. Your importer also have all the related paperwork needed, licenses and so on. And they will, you will have to pay the tariff, the import tariff, if they import VAT. In our case, that will be it. And we can do the custom clearance, okay? This will be the generic uh, procedure. Let's see step by step how it looks. Um, step by steps, basically, the first thing is we check if we have the protocol and the export model or health certificate. 
okay? How to get the protocol is a little bit outside the scope of today uh, presentation and webinar, but basically it is a negotiation at the technical level between both governments, your government in Europe and the Chinese government. At the moment, as of yesterday, these are the, uh, the, the situation according to the Chinese official data. So some countries do have a protocol and a sanitary certificate, others do not. Um, this is not the final information because then the companies need to be listed. So it may be the case, uh, for example, of Finland when the documents are ready, but the company is still not listed, hopefully will be listed soon and then can start exporting, okay? If you're on the list, you need to get the AQSIQ food exporter and manufacturer um, license. This is not a complicated process. You do it online. Uh, some things are in Chinese, but normally most of your governments have um, a guideline. So you go through, you do everything online. It's not complicated, but remember, now it's not only the food exporter, the manufacturer also have to be registered in our case, okay? Um, before, just in case that you stay before the, the, the change, it was only the exporter. Since 1st October, there is a change there and we need exporter and manufacturer, okay? Uh, you have the website there. It is not a complicated process. Send us an email if you do have any issue with it. Now, you need to register as an exporter, which may mean, in some cases, we can almost guarantee that the Chinese inspector will go and visit your facilities before approval. This is not very common, for example, for cheese, if you're a cheese exporter, but if you do infant formula, we can say it's 100% sure. That means that it will take some time before the Chinese inspectors can go to your country, check your facilities, and uh, supply to your government a report whether you are complying 100% or you need to get some improvements before you can export, okay? If we're ready to export, we need to check the labeling, like we said. Now, there is a regulation following the labeling. Um, this is a generic rule, so it works for more than one country. We've list listed there the information, and on the guideline, you will find all the details if you would like to check them. I have to say that labeling is probably once you have the once your country and have the protocols and you as an SME have been listed, is probably where we face more issues when EU SMEs are exporting to China. It is relatively common to do something wrong at the labeling. Sometimes because the regulation changes a lot. And it's a bit complex, sometimes because we don't manage it properly. So we need to be very careful on how we do the labeling. It is not easy, but it's not impossible at all. But we really need to understand what we're doing or seek for advice. A lot of um, agencies, governments, and certainly the USME Center are there just for this reason, just to help you out on keeping updated. So it is very important that you work with them work with the USME Center as the ex expert and get updated information when you need it, okay? There is another standard that you need to keep into consideration when you do the labeling and the export. The food additives is one of them because we cannot assume that the additives that we're using in Europe are allowed in China. That, that, is, a, that is a wrong assumption in some cases. So you need to double check that this would be the case. There is also a nutrition labeling standard that you need to know. It's not very complicated, but you actually need to know it. Um, if you want to see how it looks a label, it's not that different from the way it looks a label in Europe. Only it has to be in Chinese with the information that we are indicating you that you should add, okay? Um, now this, as you can see, this label, may have been put in origin or may have been put uh, when it was this one was put in origin some of them they're put here in china now remember that that may not be possible in the future certainly not for infant formula if you see here over dairy products uh, yogurt or milk powder again 
the you have to include the um, nutrition um, in terms of percentage of the average consumption of energy per day. It works in the same way or very similar to the way it works in Europe, based on 100 grams or milliliters. Um, that is how you have to explain the amounts and based on a 2,000 calories per day diet when you're indicating how much energy you're putting into them. Then you need to add the documents. When you're exporting, and you may have exported to other countries, you know you have to export with other products. Now, of course, among, if you're exporting from one place in the European Union to another, in Europe to another, this may not be a big issue. You may not need them. But if you are selling outside, you probably are familiar with most of these products, the commercial invoice, the packing list, the health or sanitary or phytosanitary certificate, the airway bill, insurance, cargo manifesto. This is common if you're exporting outside the European Union in most of the cases. There is a few things that are specific for China that we have explained. Like for example, the AQSIQ uh, registration. This is something that is unique for China, okay? So although it looks a lot, most of these papers, most of this paperwork you already do if you want to export to other countries. If you have any questions, please check the link there and with information of your tari code, you will be able to know what are the requirements in terms of documents or check our um, guideline if you want information in the next few weeks. Custom inspection basically is your product will go through customs and they will check whether your product is what you claim to be. So first, you will only be a proof if you're theoretically supplying certain product, but now we will check that actually what's inside of the package is what you're saying it is. Now, this introduces one very important concept for us, which is the concept of first import. The concept of first import is very intuitive. It, what it, it, it's almost what it sounds like. The first time I go through the process it is a first import, and therefore I will be checked very carefully, okay? Now, the problem is that in China, since we've said implementation is very different, the concept of first import is very restrictive. It applies only to exactly the same conditions that previously. So it's the same product, labeling, ingredients, but also the same port. If we change the port, then it's not the first import anymore, and we will be, it's, it's, it's not, keeps being the first import, so it's not imported before, therefore we will be checked more carefully. So we have to be aware of this situation where first import doesn't mean I already send the product to China. It has to be exactly the same procedure than before. Now, if we've been through the procedure successfully, then the next time we will uh, attach all the information, all the documents that we're going to get, and it will make things easier for us on subsequent imports which are not considered the first import. I hope this uh, concept is clear. Um, otherwise, please send us an email or ask the questions that you would like. Now, there is a lot of standards on dairy. Uh, if you put them on a paper, it will probably go around the paper. You will use the paper on both sides. Now, most of them may or may not be too long, and it's very hard to keep updated with all of them. So my suggestion is that you keep asking the expert. For example, um, checking the guideline that we will be releasing in a few weeks from now will keep you updated on what's important for you. If you are in a very specific situation, then ask, and we will check and get back to you. And finally, of course, you will have to pay your import duties and uh, VAT, important VAT. This operates in a very normal and clear way and is not worth comment. And specifically, if you, want to if you want to check if there's been any change uh, recently, the infant formula has increased the import duty to 15%, while um, whey protein has reduced it to 6%, okay? for the rest remains in the same way. 
Now, in terms of regulation, basically we've seen most of it, but we would like to devote the last 10 minutes or so of the presentation before we go into questions on key points that you should know once the product is in China and making some comments on e-commerce. So for those of you that are not familiar with the concept, we can make it a bit more clear. One key point that you have to understand is that Regardless what you think about China, about prices in China, your product is going to get much more expensive where you're selling in China. Much more expensive where you're selling in China. Now, we may argue whether the problem is transportation, is the import duties, is, and of course that affect the price, but it's mostly the distribution system here in China, all the costs involved to the distribution, which makes the product very expensive. So your export price will grow 100 to 200 percent. So it will be two times or three times the price um, that you have exports to get to your final price. In the example we've put here, is 200, um, 150 percent higher. Okay, it may change it depending how many sub distributors are there. But make no mistake, China is not cheap for imported products. Uh, China is less and less cheap overall, certainly. Um, but for imported foodstuffs, it's not cheap. You're not selling based on price. You're selling based on quality and food safety. Uh, it is very important you have keep this in mind when you're developing your strategy as an SME. You have to understand that cold chain preservation could be an issue. It has improved incredibly in China. And I have to say that logistics in China for products that do not require cold chain it is excellent. It is very, very good. But those products requiring cold chain gets a bit more tricky despite the improvement. So you need to be a bit careful and the government will be checking much more often. We also have, may have to adapt to the formats that are used in China. So on the go consumption is very high here. We need to check where we'll be selling, certainly for dairy. Hypermarkets and superstores are probably where they're selling the most but we need to keep a very close eye on online retailing. Online retailing is booming for food industry. The USME Center in cooperation with Avens will also be releasing a report in a few weeks that you can check on how um, FMB is selling in China. Why is this the case that if our products are much more expensive than local products, we're still selling, we saw at the beginning, we're still increasing export continuously? Well, basically, because China cannot produce as much as they need, that's one thing, but even if they could, they've had scandals in the past more than once, which has affected the trust of the Chinese consumer in the industry, generally speaking. It is also true that the regulation applies strictly on foreign producers, while it's less strict on domestic producers. This certainly has a lot of issues. It is harder to get all the paperwork to be able to export to China, and your product gets expensive. But once you're in, this situation has already built a very clear competitive advantage for you. Despite the price, Chinese got the money to pay these prices. Not all of them, but a good number of them do have it. And they perceive your product, rightfully, as a very safe, high quality product. So they take no risks. This is also very important to understand. So the scandals, believe it or not, may have affected you in a positive way, despite all the technical uh, barriers raised after them. Finally, and before we get into questions, for e-commerce, what's to know to understand what's e-commerce? Um, some of you may be very well aware of e-commerce, but let's, let's check um, what this means for those who don't know. Now, the traditional system basically will work in this following way. You will have your country of origin in Europe, then you will ship the product, probably, probably by boat, we don't know, it doesn't really matter. You will pay your tariffs 
and taxes. You will do the import process and the product will be in China and your distributor, probably using sub-distributors in some parts of China, will get to the customer. So you will do the traditional procedure. Now, e-commerce have changed this a little bit. Remember that we have uh, e-commerce, traditional e-commerce or e-commerce based in China and cross-border, okay? If we do cross-border, which is the graph in the middle, the product will be in Europe, but two things may happen now that are different. Either the client will buy the product online with our product being in Europe, and then to be able to deliver on time, we will ship the product, we will fly it, because otherwise we cannot comply with the commercial requirements to deliver in a few weeks. We will ship the product, and then the taxes will be paid. Now, cross-border, taxes will be paid to reach the final consumer. Now, cross-border has one difference, which is the taxes that are applying. Cross-border e-commerce do not apply the traditional uh, tariff and VAT. As you can see in the graph, it says tax only. Is the personal postal article tax, which is 10% for food, what you pay, nothing else. So in terms of taxation, cross-border e-commerce is an advantage. If you combine these with what has been the reality so far that um, cross-border e-commerce was benefiting for, a, let's say, an unclear regulation and a much less clear application of this regulation, it meant that it was a good advantage to get products into China, especially daily, which are kind of complex, to get all the paperwork right and get into China. So cross-border has been working in this way as a description. I'm not giving any um, personal opinion on the subject. This is what has been happening. Now this may be changing a bit in terms of not taxation, but certainly in terms of regulation. It, it, it should and will be checked to be the same that in the traditional system. Now, cross-border could also work in a different, a slightly different way, which is using the free trade zone or bonded warehouses that I explained before. So we will not fly the product when they buy, but we will ship the product as cheap as possible, no matter how slow, to a warehouse, uh, let's say in uh, Shanghai, as a good example for the uh, new pilot free trade zone, but it could be Tianjin, Wanjo, there's others. Um, some people actually use Hong Kong uh, as, as, a, as a place to stock the product next to China. So you stock it there, and whenever they purchase, in that moment you actually pay the taxes and deliver the product. So depending how long, certainly boat shipping is much cheaper than air shipping. So you can actually deliver cheaper, maybe, and faster because the product is already in China. The, the thing to say whether this system is cheaper or not will depend on how much product and for how long do you keep them in the warehouse at the free trade zone, since these warehousing are relatively expensive, certainly more expensive than your own warehouse, okay? And finally, we have the traditional or domestic-based e-commerce platforms. Basically, uh, the, those are simple to explain. You got your product in Europe, you ship it to China, you pay the tariff and VAT, and, your imp and, and it will be a store within China until the client purchase it, and then it's delivered to the final customer, okay? I hope this gave you um, an idea of how e-commerce works in terms of procedure. Again, we will have the chance to see more details in the future, okay? Uh, in different materials that we will be explaining at the very end of the presentation. Uh, certainly, dairy is a category or is a sub-industry that wor is working very well on e-commerce, so it's worth checking uh, our options there if we do have um, the potential to access uh, e-commerce in China. Um, this will be all. Uh, that's exactly one hour from my presentation point of view. Uh, we will be taking advantage now to 
answer a few of the questions that you have mentioned. There's been quite a lot, there's been many, so we may not be able to answer all of them. Then we will send the answers later. Uh, if you still have questions after that, please send us an email and uh, within a few days we will send you additional answers. You want us to do the poll, the last poll? So yeah, just before we come to the Q&A session and we would like to launch the last poll, also a uh, quick um, assessment of the topic today. So when using um, cross-border e-commerce model, would you comply with the same food safety regulations required for the traditional exports? Yes and no. As I can see here, the majority of you have choose yes, and which is great. So um, we, as I see here, we have received a lot of questions today, and we will try to get through some of them before the end of the webinar. Okay, so um, uh, as for the poll that we just passed, uh, can, can we move back to the previous um, to see the results? Well, it doesn't really matter. So um, if you can, we share it again. Yeah. So do you need to follow the same food safety regulations where you're doing cross-border? Most of the people said it right. Yes, you should. Now, I understand the confusion of those who think that may not be the case because it certainly in practice has not always been the case. But it should, and in the future it will be checked more thoroughly that you are complying with the same regulations, okay? Now, I do agree that implementation, full implementation may take some time, but we should get adapted to this situation as soon as possible. Okay, so I would like to go through some of the questions that you've been sending. Um, may not be all of them, but certainly we can go through a number of them. Now, um, one of the SMEs say, well, I, I've said that if you change the port, then it's not uh, first import. And the question is, what if it lives from a different port in Europe? Now, that wouldn't be an issue. We're talking about the port in China. So if you're sending from Rotterdam, but you change it to um, Helsinki, then you're fine. That, that, that wouldn't be a change. OK? Um, another question that I, I do have here is, if the AQSIQ uh, list mandatory in case of cross-border e-commerce for daily product, um, well, if, if it should be. Uh, the, the question is, it, it should be. Uh, if probably you may say, well, I know one example or I know a couple examples where it hasn't been the case. Yeah, may, maybe it hasn't been the case, but it should have been the case that you need to be fully registered, okay, um, to export to China for infant formula or for the rest of the products. If you are on the bonded warehouse, definitely yes. And remember that there is regulation saying that the new labels have to be put for some products before. If you're selling directly from Europe to a person, then you may find a situation that is not entirely clear regarding the labeling, and this may be a little bit of a blurry area, but it's getting smaller and smaller. So you should get on the list and you get um, AQSAQ approved exporter, okay? You should. Whatever is happening at the moment may be a bit different. Um, is the Chinese labeling mandatory in the case of cross-border e-commerce for non-infant dairy products? If you're selling on the, as we said, if you're selling on the Chinese e-commerce platforms, you need the e-label. The law is very clear on this. Now, if the Chinese are buying, for example, from your website in Europe, directly from your website, it doesn't really say. 
So we cannot, we cannot rightfully say, well, listen, in this article, it says that you have to do it. If they're buying from your website, it doesn't really say. Um, now we will see in the next few months how this shapes and the do's and don'ts from the practical point of view. Another question that we have here is, do the rules of inspection and food safety for cross-border e-commerce from bonded warehouses also include cross-border from Hong Kong? Well, if you're taking the product from the European Union to Hong Kong, no, it does not. Uh, if the question is, I'm um, stocking the product in Hong Kong and then I'm sending it to China, our understanding is that it should comply. That now, Chinese mainland China may not go to check on Hong Kong um, special administrative region warehousing, that's for sure. But when the product gets into China, you will have to be compliant, okay? I hope uh, this clarifies the question. Now, for the Chinese labels, the exporter do the label. That's another question that we got here. Um, you should, that's what we're saying at the moment. For infant formula, certainly yes, you have to put it in Europe. For the rest of the product, this is what is being announced and now they're taking comments. So it's still under draft. But it looks like it's gonna move this way. Now, I have to tell you, Romor has been there for 10 years that this will be the case. And probably at some point it will start being the case. Now, that doesn't mean that your importer will not help you designing the label. They know the product, they can help you design the label, but you may have to put it in Europe. For infant formula, certainly. For the rest of the products, not official yet, but it's been announced. Um, some people will ask about the slide 20, if I could explain um, the geographic limitation rules, it applies to the domestic producers. Um, basically, what they're trying to eliminate is a common situation that China faces that the dairy producer will produce an unlimited number of brands and use an unlimited number of distributors in different regions. And it was very hard to keep track on what you could do or you could not do. But this is being eliminated and this is for domestic producers. So I don't think that will be the case of uh, European small and medium enterprise exporting. Um, how will China enforce uh, regulations on e-commerce platforms that are located overseas? For example, maintenance of traceability, will they be blocked or they will not be blocked? Uh, as we have explained, and you will be able to read on the guideline, now everybody is supposed by law or forced by law to check on your partners. Okay, so the importers are supposed to the, ex, the importers are supposed to check on the exporters. So whoever you're buying from in China, whoever is is based in China getting your product, is supposed to check it. Now, if you have your own platform based in the European Union and you're not trying to operate with China, it is much harder to check. But if you're using a platform based in China, whether it's cross-border or it's domestic based, then they will have to check, okay? Not to mention if you are actually using the shopping shop system. If you are actually running your shop within their e-commerce shopping mall, in which case you're not just exporting the product, but you're actually managing the product in China or you're resp uh, responsible for it. And a final question, because we're going a little bit over in time. Can the Chinese label be a sticker on the original prepackaged wrapping of the products? And does it have to be on every single product or can it be only in the box of products? Um, regarding of where do you have to put the labels, you are supposed to label the product as the product will be sold. So if you're selling it by the bottle, each bottle. If you're selling it by the box, each box. However, the officer in customs have to believe that this is the case. So if you're selling, well, I'm only putting the label outside the box because I will sell them in boxes. 
but then inside there's individual package of candies, it is very likely, or yogurt, it is very likely that the import officer will say, well, sir, just your idea is just not believable. Those yogurt will be sell into small packages, no matter what you say. So you have to label one by one or in packs of four, which is common, okay, here as it is in Europe. So where to put the label will apply to whatever or whatever format you will be using for selling and the import officers actually believe in this, all right? As for if the original has to be a sticker on the pre-packed wrapping of the product, like we said, this we have explained before, so I will not uh, repeat. If you have any questions, send us on an email. Okay, so um, this will be it. I'm sure that you may have uh, more questions or you may be interested in the subject. So in a few weeks, the center will be releasing um, an update on the daily products guideline in China and also a report on FMB e-commerce in China. Um, please check within March, probably in the second half, that will be available on the website. Okay, thank you, Pablo, for the great presentation today, and I hope you have benefited from it, as Pablo has touched some useful points for exporting dairy products to China. So I just want to leave you with some updates um, on the upcoming activities, and as you could see in the screen, that the center will be rolling out a couple of um, training workshops in Europe and China, uh, particularly on the food and beverage sectors. And I would like to highlight the um, training, the advanced training on how to sell your food and beverage products online in China on uh, March 8th in Madrid, which will be delivered in Spanish and on March 10th in Brussels, which will be delivered in English. And as Pablo mentioned, we, we are going to have some upcoming publications on the dairy guideline update and the new report on selling food and beverage products online. And we also invite Pablo for our um, next e-learning programs to to give you a more comprehensive information and support on uh, exporting food and beverage products to China through the cross-border e-commerce model. Um, so let's stay in touch and we look forward to seeing you in our next event. Thank you for listening.